while we're in the program, we, we train and compete full time. So my, my, uh, my primary job right now is to be the best in the world at 55 kilograms. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast presented by Spartan Combat. This is your host, Ryan Warner. It's Friday, January 13th. Our guest today is Max Nowry, three-time world team member for Team USA's Greco team. He took fifth place in the 2022 World Championships. Back in 2008, he was an Illinois State champion. It was awesome to have Max on the podcast, and I hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to our friend Tim Brosnan. He took a 15-year hiatus from the sport while raising three daughters, and one of them now is involved with wrestling, and he's back in and binging this podcast. So, Tim, thank you so much for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life. We greatly appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who's listening right now. We really do appreciate every single one of you that listens and spreads the word. This episode is brought to you by Beat the Street Chicago. I want to thank a listener of this podcast. This individual is a listener of this podcast and heard the call to support Beat the Street Chicago and gave a $1,500 donation. So thank you very much. Beat the Street Chicago is a first-class organization. They just released their impact report for 2022, which you can read on btschicago.org. Here are a few high-level stats. In 2022, they worked with over 2,500 wrestlers. Those wrestlers logged over 450 hours of after-school homework help, and 91% of them reported having more self-confidence. 86% felt more accountable for themselves. So this is an organization that's out there in the trenches doing real work every day. And our goal is for every Chicagoan, Chicago youth, I should say, to say that wrestling changed their life. So if you feel impacted by wrestling and want to support an organization that's doing the Lord's work, go to btschicago.org slash donate. That's btschicago.org slash donate. This episode is also brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant takes the money ball approach to college wrestling. They track and timestamp hundreds of activities in a college wrestling match, input that data into their cloud analytics platform, and on their app, which you can download in the Apple and Google Play stores, you can see detailed statistics on college wrestlers. You can compare different wrestlers. So go to Quant Wrestling on the Apple and Google play stores quant wrestling download the app now and that's it folks let's give it up for the great max nowry max nowry welcome to the podcast thanks for having me yes sir always good to have an illinoisan on i was reading about you and i i heard that you had gone to the fila cadet tournament in 05 and i think i was at that same one and i'll never forget David Taylor and his St. Paris Graham All Grays. And I, I read that there was a story there where you guys scrapped and that uh that was a little bit of a turning point for you. Yeah. Um you know, um everyone knows David's been great since we were little kids and um, you know, we're we're both the same age. Um but yeah, it was a forty two kilos and under for freestyle, and uh, it was a little bit too small for the weight. 
So, you know, that was a little rough to, to start with. And then, but yeah, I do vividly remember him going in for a double and just jumping up in the air and getting five points. So that wasn't too fun at the moment. But yeah, it's, it's a good learning experience, though. Um, I, I took it seriously. And, you know, even though um, I was a little bit smaller for the weight, um, I think things like that that occurred uh, throughout my career kind of helped direct and, and shift, you know, where I ultimately got to. And at that point, were you going to overtime? I believe this might have been the year before. Oh, I started overtime. And I think I started overtime the year after that. 2006, I believe, was my first year at overtime. Man, for people who don't remember, what was it like in those rooms back then? Like, who were some of your workout partners, and what was the what was the scene like? It was special, you know. It, it was the best room in, in the country at the time. Um, I'm working out with guys like John Morrison. Um, oh, wow, I'm trying to think back now. I'm drawing a blank. Like, but I mean. Were you going John, to Naperville or? Yeah, Naperville. Okay. Um, you know, John Morrison, it was, just, it, it was a, a – just a solid group from from around like the whole Chicagoland area. And then you had guys like Andrew Howard driving in from Indiana. Um, and from one side of the room to the other side, it was just, you know, that's what, you know, Illinois freestyle duel team was made up primarily of all those old overtime guys when we started winning the duels. Uh, it, was, it was a special room to be in. And I think, um, you know, on top of just being around so many great guys, it was, there wasn't anything special to the to the the structure of what was going on. Um, I think Coach Bormet did a really good job of just drilling the basics into us, and then it just showed um, throughout time. And you were also wrestling Greco a lot. How did you get introduced to Brian Medlin and that whole crew? So my coach at Wheeling High School, Neil Weiner, um, he had talked me into going to wrestle uh, – freestyle and Greco at the Fila Cadets. Uh, back then I was just doing uh, folk style and freestyle, afraid to do Greco Roman. Didn't really like it too much, but he's like, come on, it's five hours more for, for both styles. You get double the matches. So, um, so when I, when I got talked into doing both styles at the uh, Fila Cadets that year, um, I qualified for the, um, the cadet, uh, the cadet, uh, sorry, I want to say world team, the cadet dual team. And that's when I met coach Medlin and, um, and he was trying to get me to, to wrestle the duels. And, and I was kind of like timid on it. Cause I wasn't really, you know, much of a Greco guy. I was primarily focused on freestyle. And um, because of, because of coach Weiner getting me to, you know, do both styles that led me into meeting coach Medlin and that was kind of a big turning point. And we still have a great relationship. He still coaches me to this day. So if it wasn't for, for coach Weiner talking me into doing both styles and coach Medlin make me love it. Um, you know, I wouldn't have that, you know, dove full into, into Greco Roman, but you know, it's very special to have something like that. And especially someone like coach Medlin, who is still in my career. Um, you know, he's the one that, got me to really enjoy it. him and coach Powell. They brought an atmosphere that made me just not just myself, but you know, a lot of guys just want to be around them and, and participate and have fun. They are special. Those two together. I couldn't even imagine being in a room with, with Mike Powell and coach Medlin. No, I, I just, I love those summers when you got to see both of them and, and be around both of them. Maybe not want to wrestle the folk style season after a while. Cause I just want to dry, just dive right back into freestyle and Greco. And to your point, you you get introduced to Greco, you win cadet states or however it ends up. You're on the cadet team, Illinois um, Greco team. And <laughs> what was your first experience with Greco and, and how did Coach Madeline kind of present it to you? So we had the the cadet dual team camp at Maine South High School. Uh, I was I had just gotten back from Bulgaria because um, the the. Fila, the Fila Cadet Tournament at Northwestern that qualified me to go to a, to a two week trip in Bulgaria. So I just gotten back from Bulgaria, I think. And um, I was kind of on the, you know, the edge of, you know, I wanted to do the duels, but only in freestyle. 
and you know, he convinced me to do both styles and, and talked me into it just like coach Weiner did um, for the uh, field of cadet nationals. And then it was him and coach Pons coaching that year. And when we were, it was, I, I, it was in Missouri, the cadet duels were in Missouri. And I remember halfway through, I was just, I was having so much fun. Like the atmosphere with, with Ellis Coleman and his brother, little Sean, and like, um, you had uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Chase, like just a whole bunch of like fun guys to be around. And halfway through the duels, I went up to coach Madeline. I was like, Hey, is it too late for me to sign up to go, uh, wrestle at Fargo for Greco. I was qualified. I just didn't sign up for it because I was only playing wrestling freestyle. And he's like, oh, he, he checked in on it for me. He's like, yeah, you, you're good. Um, if you want to wrestle both styles, you can still wrestle both styles. So I, I had such an enjoyable time at the duels that I wanted to do it at Fargo. And then from there, it was just, you know, it was nothing but a you know great ride so far. And then how did it go that year at Greco? Excuse me, at Fargo for you in Greco. That year I won Fargo. Um, Whoa! So in, t- first year in Greco goes to the duels. Wins the wins the the big dance. Yeah, uh, first year in Fargo, I had just wrestled freestyle um, and lost in a three way tie back when they did the the pool system, and then um, the second year I did both styles and I was able to win win Greco and then take third in freestyle. So um, starting to have a little more success in Greco. Um, when I was, you know, too timid at first to try it. And it's crazy because, you know, outside of those June and July months in the summer, you're probably not seeing Coach Medlin too much throughout the year, or, or is he coming up and doing training camps and you going down to see him? I didn't see Coach Medlin until the summertime for, for the duels in Fargo. Um, back then, that's the only times I saw him because uh, I don't even think I really saw him at state. Um Cause I wasn't sure how involved he was with Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, at the state tournament kind of tunnel vision on what my own thing there, but um, yeah, it's really, really thankful for that opportunity. Like he talked me into it. And then from then he's been one of the most reliable coaches I go to. And, and, and I'm just extremely comfortable with him around. And now I have like kind of the best both worlds where I get to train with the army's world class athlete program. And at times go back to Champaign and train with coach Medlin. So, you know, being able to train with him time to time and then still having him in my coat, uh, in my corner for the world team trials or final X, um, it, that, that's something that's special to me because I have him and, and coach Mango in the corner and have a very special uh, relationship with both of them. There's something about Brian Medlin where you talk to him and you just feel more calm and more relaxed. Like I, I, I was thinking about you saying how you have him as a coach. I'm like, I'd love to have him as a life coach. Like the guy's just something about him, uh, unique that way. And it's something I, it's hard to explain. And you have to experience something like that. Him and coach Powell, um, you know, coach Powell was never my high school coach. I, I wanted to, I asked my dad if I could transfer my senior year to go to Oak park. And, uh, he was not, he was not for that. He wanted me, <laughs> he wanted me to try to be the first day champ at, at Wheeling High School. But like, but because being around Coach Powell and Coach Medlin um, and them just making it so exciting and fun for me, I just always wanted to be around them. And and that that feeling you get from from someone like Coach Medlin, you know that he genuinely cares about you. And um, it like I said, if you, if you if you've never been able to experience it, you know, it's it's uh, just that I've been able to experience it. it's been it's been tremendous and it's something I'm very thankful for and what coach Powell's doing at beat the street Chicago is unbelievable I mean he's taking that same passion from Oak Park to the whole city of Chicago yeah and you know he's someone that genuinely cares too you know so you have you have I'm very fortunate to have been able to be around and experience and, and develop these relationships with with a lot of great coaches and, you know, Illinois is a huge wrestling state. So from the time I started out wrestling, um, I had Lindsey Durlocker, his brother, Dave Durlocker was my first coach. So I'm having access to him and Lindsey when he's coming back into town. I I have coach Weiner. Once I get to high school, that is, is, um, you know, he takes kids to to freestyle Greco tournaments in the weekend. He's getting them involved in, in making them wrestle outside of folk style and then that leads me into wrestling or me leads me into wrestling 
sorry, leads me into meeting people like Coach Madeline and Coach Powell, um, Coach Bormet, and then it just trickles on from there, you know, into my uh, senior career with Greco. So, I mean, it's just, I've been so fortunate enough to be around great leadership and seeing what works and, and, and how you, you know, as a coach, you can get a, a young kid like me who, you know, was timid of Greco and that's what I do for life now or for work now. Amazing. Amazing that a lot of the guys are still involved from the early days to now, you know, coach Medlin and uh, you know, some of your training partners, I'm sure. Now talk to me about this crazy 2,603 pound bracket. I was researching for our interview yesterday and I looked at the bracket. I'm like, what the hell? Like, how is that even possible? And I posted it on Twitter. I left a few guys out. Sincere apologies, Daryl Thomas being one of them. Um, I went too fast. But I look at that bracket. It doesn't make sense to me how all those hammers are in one way. You got Tony Ramos, John Morrison, BJ Futrell, yourself, Ellis Coleman, Justin Farmer, Ryan Yao. Um, bro, one of the toughest dudes, Kaz Hashimoto. A lot of people don't know that dude, but he was a really unique wrestler. So that was a loaded weight, uh -huh. though. Yeah, and um, that's something I had talked to uh, Lula Sean Coleman about um, in the last couple of years. Uh, we were just kind of reminiscing on Illinois and, and just how you know tough some of those weight classes and some of those teams were. Um, or, or throughout time, you kind of forget about that. And, and then the next year in 2007, it was uh, B.J. Futrell, John Morrison, and myself, the top three at state. And then we were all in the finals at Fargo at different states. But that, you know, that led us off to a nice start at the, at the junior duels um, with us three back to back to back. We were able to, to get a pretty nice little lead on whatever team we were wrestling. Man, that's those. I mean, you take it to that level, the junior teams, it's that's crazy. I mean, those were those were some great years. I also want to make sure I'm not leaving out um, a few guys from this bracket just because the Illinois guys, that get a little finicky if you leave them out. I'm just going to run through Joe Roth, Dale. See, I don't I never remember this guy. Dale Ro Ro Rose. Rose. Yeah. 39 and three, though, as a sophomore. I mean, in the, again, in 2006, I was a junior. <clears throat> but, bro, this guy really tough. All goes on here. Joe Norton's on here. Whew. Chris Spangler. I mean, and just so folks know, Chris Spangler beat Tony Ramos in overtime in the finals. Um, John Morrison didn't even place. Futrell took fifth. I mean, Tyler. I mean, we can't forget Tyler Johnson either. I mean, just a just a a killer's <laughs> bracket for non Illinois folks are probably bored of it, but I bring it up just because. You look back at some of the guy, some of those brackets in IKWF in high school. Like Illinois was rolling deep at that time, and you were competing against all those guys: the Morrisons, the Ramoses, the Spanglers. What was that like? Hey, you know, that was if you could. You know, I'm wrestling with the best in the state, but the best in the state were the best in the country at that time. You know, with the Morrisons and the Spanglers, they're they're at overtime, and I'm getting those guys every single day. So. If you have a bad day, you're going to know real fast, um, you know, so you, you it, but it was, it wasn't, um, you know, when you have so many hammers in a room, it can become negative kind of quickly, but the way it was structured, it was, it was just, you know, like I said, it was always the basics and always just sticking to, you know, what works and matches and, you know, being around those guys, like I said, I'm around the best in the country in my workout room, you know, in the state. So it was very fortunate. Again, like I've, I've been blessed with, you know, nothing but fortunate experiences and, and opportunities throughout my life as a young wrestler, being around all those top guys. And then your senior year, 2008. So I, I was 07, you're 08. Um, you're at 103. Was that a hard cut to make 103 as a senior? Now I was smaller as a senior than I was a junior. Um, yeah, I was because at Fargo, um, I was 84 pounds, 91, 98, then 105. Um, so I didn't, I usually didn't get higher than 113, uh, 113, 114. But I was kind of always disciplined on, I was, I was getting above 112, but I was too small to wrestle 112. So I always, 
you know, went right back down 103. And so your senior year, you wrestle another great Edwin Cooper in the finals. Had you guys wrestled before that? I don't think me and Ed had wrestled ever in a match before that. We've wrestled that overtime. Um, and we were always around each other growing up. He was wrestling for the little Celtics, so we'd always see each other. Um, I don't think we ever wrestled each other until the state the state finals. And for, you know, Illinois people, the grand march is, is huge. I mean, what, what memories do you have of, like, that match and kind of how you were feeling before you walked out there? You know, you, usually usually I have a lot of nerves um, leading up to, to bigger, you know, bigger stages. Um, but I had been at the, at the state tournament as a 7th and 8th grader to watch. You know, and I think I got more chills and nerves as a young kid uh, when the lights went out and you see the IHSA, uh, the lights go around the building and people are trying to chase it down and throwing, you know, gloves and balloons around. So when I was getting ready for the state march, um, or the grand march, I wasn't kind of there in the moment experiencing it. I was, I was kind of reflecting and picturing back how I remembered it when I was younger. So I was kind of experiencing it from like an outer perspective and that kind of kept me a little more level headed. And I enjoyed this experience a lot, but I think me kind of thinking about it from when I was viewing it as a young kid, you know, that kind of, it's like I said, it kept the nerves away, but you know, I was able to enjoy the moment too. And I think it also made it a little more special because, you know, I'm not just looking at, at the dark floor ahead of me. I was able to kind of just take myself back to, you know, seeing how cool the experience is from the top of that place kind of out of body almost kind of yeah and like you said man going there as a youngster and seeing the lights go out for the first time you just there's nothing like it no you just hear stories about it and the same as Fargo I always heard stories about this place called Fargo and the tournament called Fargo and then finally got to go for the first time and, and I think because of all the lead up of you know hearing these stories and like then you know finally getting to experience it you know by the time I'm there I've kind of already like felt like I've been there before. And then not long after that, you end up at, is it Northern Michigan? Yep. So what was the process from February of your senior year? You go down to Champaign, win a state title. How do you get from there to Northern Michigan? So because, um, you know, back, back in the early 2000s, if you had placed top four at Fargo, then that qualified you for a free week of training uh, either at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs or at Northern Michigan in Marquette, Michigan. Uh, all you had to do was get there, you know, pay to get there, and then room and board is covered for a week. Uh, so after placing in, in Greco, uh, my first year there qualified me to go to Northern Michigan, and I went up there. You know, I got to finally experience Ivan Ivanov for the first time, him and Jim Grunewald, and then, um, you know, being around Spencer Mango, and, you know, Joe Betterman and all the, you know, I'm being around these senior level athletes who are younger at the time. They're at the start of their senior level, but I'm, I, I've am i already known their names and I've, I've heard of them. And now I'm getting to share a wrestling room with them and, you know, kind of mingle in, you know, I remember Joe Betterman took me to the, to the movies to watch Spider-Man uh, the first time I was up there. So I got to like kind of jump in and see what the, you know, it's a develop. it was a, supposed to be a developmental program, but that was the top room for Greco Roman at the time. And my first trip up there, I was like, dad, I want to go up there. Um, that was sophomore year. So by the time junior year came around, I didn't want to wrestle my senior year. You know, so I had, a, I had a whole bunch of things going on where um, I wanted to skip my senior year and just go up to Northern Michigan early. When that was shot down, then I was like, all right, I want to go to Oak Park. That was shot down. So I stayed home and, uh, you know, wrestled that year out and then went up to Northern Michigan as soon as I could. Man, that is. So you were up there from an early age and wanting to go. And and so when you get up there, it's probably just like an assumed thing that you're going to go to college there. Did you even consider anywhere else? No, because I was, I was small for, you know, I was 103, all four years of high school. And, um, you know, the idea of, you know, getting bigger for 125, you know, that was something I could have done, but 
my when you know my parents and I sat down and talked about it um you know if I wanted to continue wrestling after college this was a good opportunity to kind of not not waste four years wrestling um folk style if I was going to do freestyle uh, Greco after that and at the time there wasn't a developmental freestyle program like there is now if there was a freestyle program probably would have you know try to opt into that first but Mm -hmm. um you know the whole mindset was I loved Jim and Yvonne those two together is is a special blend just like uh, coach Melon and coach Powell so you know being around them and you know kind of foregoing that that NCAA route and just jumping straight into international wrestling was you know a decision that was made very easily for me so tell me about coach Ivanov I don't know a lot about him like how would you describe his philosophy he's brilliant he's like a mad scientist um it takes a while to get used to him. Uh, his, his structure and his system is is very unique. I remember the first week I was at Northern Michigan, I was sore from my head to my toes that it hurt to even roll out of bed. Um, Why is that? Because he, the way he works with the Bulgarian bags and the dummies and, you know, just that, you know, different European style training. Um, you know, my body was, my you know, my body wasn't, used to using certain muscles um but after you know i was only able to have a year and a half with yvonne but i i you know i was there previously for for a lot of camps and stuff that first year there i, I noticed a lot of differences in my wrestling i was a lot more explosive you know trying throws when i was never a thrower and but he he's very meticulous and he's very like methodical with his with the way he structures his program and, you know, just being with him for a year and a half full time, um, you know, paid, you know, paid off a lot. And then you have Jim Grunewald on, t- on top of that. So Yvonne was like the the meticulous, um, you know, technical guy. And then Jim was just like the dog that just got the, you know, the t- tenacity up. And, and he was my favorite. So it was it was a, a special blend. And I loved having Jim there, you know, especially in my corner because of the way, you know, the certain – when you have a corner coach that you, that gets you, they know exactly what to say. It just, you know, it brings you, you know, so much peace of mind. And you know, Coach Medlin to this day doesn't say much in the corner, but like there's there's certain words he says, and I can hear him and I can hear Coach Mango, and they don't they only need to say a word or two, but it brings me like back to like a steady like mind and, and heart. There, you know, during a time when you're amped up and in the middle of wrestling, so. But the Bulgarian bags thing is interesting. So he obviously not only invented the Bulgarian bag, but he's a big proponent of it, which is good to see. And actually, I hope I'm going to get one of these things because I've been wanting them for years. So he's doing that kind of stuff. Um, what kind of like meticulous drills is he doing? Like, do you have any examples of like things he would do different than you were previously exposed to? Not there was not any like. But like, what was his routine for practice? It was it was different. So it was different and, um, you know, with his training methods in the Bulgarian bag and stuff, you know, your grip's going to go. So like our, we had, we all had good grip strength, uh, wrestling with the bags. And, you know, we were at that time, we were his, you know, kind of like his test dummies in a way, you know, cause all the new ideas and products he has, he's trying it out on us, um, you know, I feel a little, you know, after going through that, I feel worse for the older guys who were really there at the beginning. But it, it was, um, like there, there was some times where he, he just like loses himself during a practice and he forgets time and we're just going at it and doing these, these, these situations or rotations of live or drilling. And the way that he shows a two on one, you know, I'd walk into the wrestling room and him and Spencer or him or Harry Lester would have already been going at it for like 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And it wasn't like, like he was very technical, but it was the way he taught it and just kind of slowly wearing someone down. And his thing was a two on one. And, and I kind of attached to that right away because, you know, it, and I haven't felt someone like him on your arm after, you know, three minutes, you, it, you just wanted to like be cut, <laughs> be cut off. But so it was kind of just like the, just the over and over drilling of drilling to perfection over and over again, repeatedly, you know, um, whether it's a two on one arm drags, anything he showed, he took his time. And, you know, the, the, a lot of practices 
you know, weren't under two hours because he wanted to, he, he wanted to share everything in his brain with all of his athletes. So, I mean, there wasn't like a specific training thing I could like speak on. Everything was, every day was kind of different. All I know is that we had matches on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoons and the circuit in the morning on Wednesdays, but the rest was kind of like, we didn't know what we were showing up to until he uh, walked out of his office with his binder and told us, you know, what was going to happen. And so the circuit that was only on Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings, once a week. Okay. So I would think they'd be, it's good to know you don't have to do it that often. And is that Bulgarian bags? And is that like where you have the, the ropes tied or the bands tied to the wall, that kind of stuff? Yes. We didn't do the bands. We did ropes. We did ropes. Uh, we did the bag, uh, a lot of partner lifts. And then he liked to call them chimneys where we were running up and down the bleachers. Um, he, he had a whole, uh, know things set up downstairs in the in the football field because we were we were all in a dome so we had the whole football field indoors and in the the bleachers there so we had a lot of room to work with for those uh circuits wow man i can't even just to be a fly in the wall and see how someone like that sets it up would be awesome yeah it's it's, sorry no, go ahead. I was gonna say, what was a day in the life like? Like you, you mentioned the Tuesdays and Thursdays the match, Wednesdays you had the circuits, but were you guys doing two a days a lot of it or just one a day? Yep. So uh Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday were two a days, and then Wednesday and, and Saturday were one a days. Saturday was typically cross training. Um we would run down to a place called Presque Isle, run around it and kind of like along the water the uh, the whole time. And um you know, it was, you know, a couple mile run right on the water. And sometimes up there, it, it, the the wind gets, you know, pretty brutal. I remember coming back from some of those runs and Jake Kirby has icicles on his beard. You know, so when I think back to those days, I think back about that stuff. But watching Yvonne, just when you walk into a practice, like he, he's in his own little world and, and he, he's, you can tell he's thinking like really hard. And he's going around looking for different like things to pull out. Um you know, so just kind of like figuring out what he's going to pull out next and what we're going to be doing. He's the same from when he was my coach in Northern Michigan to when he was coaching us this past summer for the world uh, championships. And is he, would you say like a high energy guy or a real calm kind of stoic person? Very, very calm outside of practice. But as soon as he blows the whistle, he's high energy the whole time. I wish I don't know what happened with the Greco thing. I I was looking forward to seeing him in there. I'm still hopeful you know, something will happen, but it's a uh, it's cool to hear you talk about that. I want to jump forward to 2012. You get second at the Olympic trials, win a university world title. How long after that until the weight class has changed? Uh, that next year. So I was 2013. Oh no, sorry. The weight class change was in 2000 and. 14. Yep. Cause I, I enlisted in the army in 13 when we were trying to fight our way back into the Olympics. And then my first year, um, in W cap, I went from 55 kilos to 59. That had to be kind of one of those turning point moments where you, you'll never forget where you were at when you found out. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, I felt like I had just gotten big enough for 55 kilograms. Um, you know, and I just came up doing well at the Olympic trials and starting to break through. And then now I'm wrestling guys, you know, at 55 kilos and 60 kilograms. Um, so that was a very, you know, kind of brutal time for me to begin with, just trying to deal with wrestling with bigger guys. But um, without that experience, I wouldn't have been able to learn um, how to push and pull on my feet as well as I have I think I, you know, I, I was able to take a really crappy situation and now wrestling 55 again, I feel a lot better um, being able to move these guys around because I became so used to wrestling guys that were, you know, 10 to 15 pounds heavier than me. I love how you, how you look at it that way. And it, it's allowed you to, to go on and have the success you've had most recently, you know, taking a fifth this year, which we're going to get to. It's, it's, that's just the total wrestler mentality though. And you went to it right away. Tell me about, I, I just got to know 2016 at 59 must've been one of the most crazy Olympics ever. Cause like you said, you're combining two weight classes into one. Yeah. And um, you know, it's, 
you know, I'm, I'm seeing guys that I hadn't seen in so long, you know, and you got two weight classes coming together. Um, but then, you know, I thought that was kind of bad from me in a way, cause I was at the lowest weight, mm -hmm. but then come, you know, 2021, I'm wrestling 60 kilograms because 55 is an Olympic weight, but now you're wrestling it. You kind of, you got two and a half weight classes put together between 55, 60, and 63. Half of the 63 weight class is going up to 67 and half is coming down. So, you know, I felt like that was kind of worse for me than 59 was. Um, you know, I've been able to wrestle at three, three Olympic trials and I've been too small for each and every one of them. So I'm hoping that by the time I'm done wrestling, I, I'm competing at a Olympic trials at a, at a weight, you know, suitable for me. So 55 kg is a non-Olympic weight for Greco? Yes. Got it. Okay. And so you took a fifth at the world championships this past year. Round one against India, that arm throw was a thing of beauty. And then you get a, a pin in the uh, in the quarters, go on to the semis, ended up losing to Azerbaijan, lost to Japan, but still, you know, really respectable performance. What is your plan for uh, for 23? Are you going to stay at 55 and then go up? Yeah, as long as 55 kilograms is an option, I will 100% be there. Um, and, you know, that that kind of got – I got some, a lot of pushback in, in 2020 for that because I was doing both 55 and 60 kilograms. But my whole thing is just, as long as there's a weight class suitable for me, I'll compete there, and then I'll address the uh, – the larger weight class when it's, when it's appropriate. And how has the rehab been on the elbow since the world's? It's been pretty good, actually. Um, I'm still having a lot of numbness and tingling from the, cause they had to, you know, move my ulnar nerve. Um, so when I'm resting on it, a lot of numbness and tingling still shoot down my arm, but it's, uh, it's feeling a lot better than it did before the world championships. So, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a couple months, but I think, um, I think the body's starting to, uh, to adapt and heal um, from it. And the, the, one of the other things I'm going to talk to you about is two things. One is the W cap. I know what it is from the 30,000 foot level, but what, like, how would you explain it to someone who's never heard of it before? And, and how do people get involved with it? So W cap is, is stands for world-class athlete program. And the, the army and the air force have these uh, these programs so that soldiers can train and compete to pursue the world Olympic dreams. So um, we have a very good, I would say we have the best Greco room in the country right now. Um, you know, we made up half the world team and wow. we're, we're stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. So we're only 15 minutes from the training center. Um, so do you train at the training center or at the Fort Carson? We try. We go to the training center um, only during camps or when there's foreigners in town. Um, we train at Fort Carson, you know, the rest of the time. We, you know, we got a nice little spot with two full mats and then two. I think they're three quarter size mats, so we kind of wow. just st stay in our own spot uh, as much as possible. But it's, I tell people, you know, being being in WCAP is kind of like a dream job. You're a soldier athlete, so um, you enlist, uh, and then you know. There are military obligations from time to time, you know, because you're a soldier first, but the program allows you to train and compete uh, and be able to, you know, have a steady income to, you know, in a way, um, you know, it's hard. it would be a lot harder for someone who is married and has kids to rely on stipends from USA wrestling or prize money uh, from tournaments. So being in, being in WCAP allows you to kind of pursue your life in a career, you know, a career outside of wrestling, um, while still chasing down your goals of being a world Olympic champion. So it's, it's, it's a tremendous experience. Uh, I wish I would have came in sooner just so I feel like a lot of every, you know, other people that joined wish they would have came in sooner. Um, it's, it's very special because it, you know, like I said, I'm around half of the world team. We have, um, the best Greco Roman room in the country. And on top of that, you know, you're a soldier, and you have a you you have a lot of resources and access to these resources that have um, you know are there to help you you know achieve your goals and then the amount of support um, from the program and the staff that get you to tournaments and training camps that that you know we need to to be at to you know develop and continue to get better.
And what, so like, do you have a job during the day that you have to like go to the office and you train in between that? Or what, what does that look like? Uh, we all have MOSs. Um, and my, mine is, is human resource specialist, but, uh, while we're in the program, we, we train and compete full time. Wow. So, so my, my, uh, my primary job right now is to be the best in the world at 55 kilograms. And, um, but there are times where I do have to, to go to a school, uh, in 2018, I had to come back from a Bulgarian trip early to go to a, a school for a promotion. And it was a month long school and I graduated two days before we left for Vegas. So, uh, you know, but we're soldiers first. So I had to, you know, complete that, you know, military obligation. Uh, it wasn't, you know, in the best timing, but I was kind of able to make it work because I went to school in California. So I was able to drive 45 minutes and wrestle with Peyton Omanya, who wrestles at uh, Michigan State and wrestles at Greco too. So I was kind of able to make that work. But um, while we're in the program, you know, training full time, but you do have to go to those schools and, and you know, you know, fulfill those military obligations when they come up. Well, it's an awesome program. So glad it's out there. And there's a, there's a few Illinois folks who are in or have been in the program. Uh, I know the Coleman's at some point and then Kamal Bay, he's in there now, right? Yeah. Kamal just got on the team. So, you know, it, it, it's special being around, you know, especially with the Coleman, someone like Ellis, um, you know, little Sean wasn't on the team as long as Ellis was. Okay. Um, so I grew up with with Ellis when we were going to the duels together, uh, the cadet and junior duels. And now, you know, we're adults and on the same team. And so it, it's special being continuously being around people like that, that, you know, you've had a great relationship from the time you were younger to now adults and seeing the things that Ellis has done. You know, he's got a, a family of his own and kind of seeing where he developed in life has been special. I got to get Ellis Coleman on this podcast. Oh, you, you're going to need more than an hour, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, Ellis is, Ellis is an awesome, genuine guy and, and very fortunate to continue my career with him throughout all this time. Yeah. And it's cool. Like you said, it's the old, it's the old junior dual squad and Medlin's still in the corner and uh, you just sprinkle in some Spencer mango and all the, uh, some Sean Lewis, all the, all the awesome stuff you've learned throughout that process. You know, my last question for you, Max, and I'm sorry we have to wrap up early. I could talk with you for quite some time. Wrestling Changed My Life is the name of this podcast. You've been wrestling. Man, I remember you from way back, probably 25, 26 years, and you've had a lot of ups and downs, and right now you're on an upward trend. What's been the one thing you take away from wrestling that that will always uh, stay with you? Is it? I take everything with a wrestling approach, and I, I, you know, I've kind of thought about it, but I didn't speak about it too much until last week when I talked to Timmy Hans from Five Point Move. Um, Great and, article. Great article. Thank you. Um, throughout all the ups and downs, because if if you've been in the sport long enough, um, you know, if you're fortunate, you will experience ups and downs. Um, it's how you approach that stuff, and from the time I was younger, I was. I was somehow wired to, you know, approach things in a certain way and, and taking um, school classes or, you know, things in my personal life as, as a wrestling approach has only made me learn from it. There's, I've had so many failures and mistakes in my life, even as an adult, um, you know, whether I'm at fault or, you know, I'm doing something stupid that I shouldn't be doing. Like I always learn, um, you know, how to bounce back from that, from that wrestling mentality. And without wrestling, I, you know, I don't know where I'd be. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be successful. Um, you know, this whole sport changed my entire life because the biggest thing I think it teaches you and, and hopefully a lot of young kids start to understand this sooner is accountability. You know, it's an individual sport and outside of being an individual sport, you know, you have to make weight on your own. Um, you have to, you know, you know what you put into it when, you know, when you're at practice and you're kind of dogging a little bit, when you lose on the weekend, you know exactly why. Because your mind takes you right back to that practice where you were, you know, kind of being lazy and, and slacking off. So I was able to apply so many wrestling fundamentals in my head. Um, and then going back to overtime, you know, we were just, you know, Coach Bormet and Kading and Bowman's, they were just drilling the basics into us over and over again. So that's the fundamentals. So not skipping steps. That helped yep. into, into school, you know, on a, on a math problem. I like to write the whole problem or, you know, step by step, because that's just the way I'm wired. And 
because the way I was wired like that, I do that in school. And then, you know, in the things I do uh, outside of wrestling and in a personal life, I try to do everything kind of step by step and, and not take those shortcuts. So without wrestling, you know, it kind of just, it just molded and, and, and gave me a lot stronger foundation um, mentally, physically, and emotionally that, you know, I think without the sport, I wouldn't be where I, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at. But, you know, just like Coach Powell said, you know, with all the combat sports, wrestling is king. And if you're able to apply the the principles that's there for wrestling, you'll have nothing but success in your life. E- even through failures, there's nothing uh, but success to be had learning from all that stuff you learn from wrestling. Amen, brother. I love it. I I couldn't agree more with, with the way you think about the wrestler's mindset. It's been great having you on. I can't wait to get this out to the audience. Thanks for coming on, Max. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life with Max Nowry. To support this podcast, please go to btschicago.org slash donate to help every Chicago youth say that wrestling changed their life. That's btschicago.org slash donate. Also download the Quant Wrestling app, Q-U-A-N-T, Quant Wrestling. Download the app now. We'll see you next week with a new episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Peace!